Black Girls Podcast, a weekly conversation about mental health, personal development, and all the small decisions we can make to become the best possible versions of ourselves. I'm your host, Dr. Joy Harden Bradford, a licensed psychologist in Atlanta, Georgia. For more information or to find a therapist in your area, visit our website at therapyforblackgirls.com. While I hope you love listening to and learning from the podcast, it is not meant to be a substitute for a relationship with a licensed mental health professional. Hey, y'all. Thanks so much for joining me for session 248 of the Therapy for Black Girls podcast. We'll get right into the episode after a word from our sponsors. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Many of you know that I'm currently writing my first book, Sisterhood Heals, which is scheduled to be released in the summer of 2023. And our team was able to use Squarespace to create a beautiful landing page at sisterhoodheals.com that will be able to evolve as the book gets closer to publication. Right now, it's set up to gather emails from those interested in learning more and who'll be ready to hit purchase when the pre-order link comes out. But I'm also planning to share some blog posts with some behind-the-scenes thoughts and inspiration. And all of it is fully optimized for mobile so that it looks great no matter what device you use to view it. Is there a new project you're working on this year? Head to squarespace.com slash TFBG for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, enter code TFBG to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Deciding on a skincare routine for me used to be overwhelming because there's so many choices. Thankfully, I found Curology and they customized a formula for me and that process became much simpler. To get started, you answer some questions online and send in a couple of selfies. Next, they match you with a licensed dermatology provider. And if it's a good fit, they get started on your formula with three active ingredients picked for you to tackle your skincare needs. The formula that was customized for me is to help minimize fine lines and dark spots. And I've been very pleased with the results since I started using it more than a year ago. Get started with Curology just like I did with a free 30-day trial at curology.com tbg. Just pay $5 for shipping and handling. That's C-U-R-O-L-O-G-Y dot com slash T-B-G to start your free 30-day trial. Cancel anytime. Prescription is subject to consultation. Here's the only sound that's tolerable when a migraine attack strikes. Nurtec ODT Remezepan 75 milligrams can provide migraine pain relief, which can help break the silence. Nurtec is the first and only medication proven to treat and prevent migraines in adults. Don't take if you're allergic to Nurtec. The most common side effects were nausea, stomach pain, and indigestion. For important safety prescribing and patient information, visit NURTEC.com. If you've been listening to the podcast a while, you know that when we find shows we love, we try to bring them to the podcast so we can chat about the characters, captivating plot lines, and of course, any mental health implications that stand out. In this week's session, we're chatting about Peacock's new series, Bel Air, which is a dramatic reimagining of Will Smith's iconic 90s sitcom, The Fresh Prince of Bel Air. For this conversation, I'm joined by our associate producer, Elise Ellis, and senior producer, Frida Lucas. I think it's safe to say we had a ball recording this episode, and we all really love the show so far. During our conversation, we explored what we're loving about the new series, what we noticed makes Bel Air a fresh take on a nostalgic classic, some of the mental health concerns impacting the characters, and of course, our predictions for the season. If you haven't had time to watch it, you may want to put this episode on pause and save it until you're all caught up because this episode does contain spoilers. If something resonates with you while enjoying our conversation, please share it with us on social media using the hashtag TBG in session. Or come on over and join us in the sister circle to talk more in depth about the episode. You can join us at community.therapyforblackgirls.com. Here's our conversation. So I am joined today by two incredible members of our production team to have another producer roundtable. It feels like these are very fitting when we find some shows that we love. So Frida and Elise are with me today. If you will introduce yourselves. 
Hi, everyone. I am Frida Lucas. I'm the senior producer for Therapy for Black Girls. Hi, everyone. I'm Elise Ellis. I'm the assistant producer for Therapy for Black Girls. And if you got a chance to listen to our Insecure Producers Roundtable, you know we have lots of thoughts about TV shows. And so a new one that I feel like I had to do some convincing with Frida. I think Elise was already on the ball. But I watched the first couple of episodes of Bel Air and was like, y'all got to watch this. So Frida eventually came in. And now I feel like I have sold you. (laughs) <laughs> I was definitely hesitant. My partner has the Fresh Prince of Bel Air on DVD in our house. Ooh. And that is part of our morning ritual. We will watch the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. So it's still very relevant for me. And hearing that the new show was a dramatization, it wasn't necessarily something I was running to because I still feel so fulfilled from the original. However, we binge watched <laughs> The first three episodes. And I was like, this is good, good with a capital G. Mm. See, I didn't even know all of that background because I probably catch reruns every now and then, but it definitely is not something I'm watching as a part of my morning routine. So you have a stronger connection, it sounds like, in your household to the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, the original. I know all of the words to the intro, and I'm talking the extended intro when you actually see him on the plane, (laughs) in the taxi. I am very epic for Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, and I'm a big fan. Ah, okay. What about you, Elise? You, I think, like I said, I think you were already watching. Yeah. So I remember when the original short came out and I thought it was really cool. I thought it was super creative. But when I heard that they were going to turn it into a real series, I think my only worry was that I don't think the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air is like outside of people's memories yet. Mm -hmm. And so I always get a little scared. Like if you're rebooting something that people forgot about, cool but it's literally the fresh friends of bel-air like i haven't watched it like consistently in maybe five or six years but when i was in like middle school elementary school i would watch it every weekend like binge i've seen every episode so i was a little worried about that but of course i'm gonna watch it like everyone loves will smith and i think because it is still in people's memories a lot of people were excited to watch it so I was, but I was definitely skeptical of what was going on there. Mm -hmm. So I probably have a little bit of an age advantage on both of you. That's how we'll phrase it, because I remember it coming out in real time, right? Like I remember gathering with my mom. I think it was on Mondays is when it like was the actual release of the episodes. And so for me, it feels like it has been some time, right? Like y'all, it seems like are watching it, you know, in the syndication, but I watched it in real time. So, you know, at least you're point around it doesn't feel like it has been long enough out of people's memories what do you think is a good time frame for a reboot if it's going to happen it's a mix of the time frame and the relevance so I know there are talks of like people wanting a nanny reboot Mm -hmm. of the show the nanny and they talked about like Cardi B doing it yeah people love the nanny and it recently got a lot of chatter because I think they put it on HBO Max but other than that I don't think People are really strong about like rewatching the nanny. It's not a lot of consistent cultural conversations. The main character isn't as big as a star as Will Smith. So I think all those different factors contribute to the need for the reboot and whether or not the reboot has enough like distance from the original. Mm-hmm. It's the same way I felt about the Coming to America reboot. It was yes. like, okay, it was a minute ago since the movie came out, but it's such like a big cultural moment that people still talk about it. It's still brought up. Maybe once a week I see a GIF used from either the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air or that movie. And so it seems like, yeah, okay, it was released maybe 20, 30 years ago, but it's not out of our minds in terms of pop culture. Hmm, Good point. Good point. Any thoughts there for you, Frida? I think Bel-Air, the reboot of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, I hope it energizes people to look into reboots. I think reboots have had traditionally a bad rep. And so I think there is an opportunity, or I think it shows me at least as someone who has often put up a hand to the face on the reboot. I'm like, you know what? They can be done and they can be done really well. And this is an example of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, like many people, I was a little worried because the original 
is so like slapstick comedy, right? And so it, it felt hard to imagine like how are they going to make this a drama? Now, when I first saw the trailer for Morgan Cooper, I definitely was in, right? I was like, oh, this is really cool. I could definitely see how this could work. And I think Will getting on board with it, like I don't even know if this could happen if Will wasn't behind it, but I think him getting on board with it and seeing the vision also made it something that was easier for people to take a look at because you knew that it kind of had his seal of approval. I just want to add that what I think the reboot is doing really well is to your point, Dr. Joy, about the original being slapstick comedy. You forget how serious the situation was. And I think the story itself actually carried so well to be a drama Mm -hmm. because the circumstances for Will to actually have to relocate across the country, the theme song made it very light. But when you really think about it, he really got in trouble. And so just the fact that this story is dramatic and the relationship between Carlton and Will it makes me realize truly that the writer's room for the original Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, they really did a great job of making it so much fun. But the circumstances, they could have been very not fun for the family, for Will. It was a total culture clash for him as well. And so watching it, I'm like, this just really fits. It really fits. Yeah, they did a good job. And, you know, we keep using the word reboot, but I think the better term, and I think this is the term they use is a reimagining, right? Like a reimagining of the story as opposed to a reboot, because it definitely, you know, I think keeps some of the plot lines of the original, but it is a complete twist on the feel and the tone of everything. So what are your thoughts and feelings around the casting of the new family? So that is one of the parts that I'm most excited about because the cast is just beautiful, right? They are shot beautifully. The scenery is all beautiful. I just love all of that. I particularly love that like the cast is mostly dark skinned and sometimes people get a little funny with casting and you're like, now how did they cast this person as the uncle or whatever, right? So I am a fan of the casting. What are your thoughts? I enjoy it as well. I think, one, they chose great actors to portray the dynamic between Will and Carlton. This is spot on. Of course, Carlton had to be short, a little geeky, but I just think they're both pretty handsome, but also it just, it brings so much nostalgia when you do see them like side by side. You're like, oh, wow, this really hits the nail on the head. I love seeing Coco Jones play Hillary. I've kind of been waiting for her to get her shine. I follow her on TikTok. She's super funny. And I think she might be like my favorite character. I think she just does the casting well. She's really dynamic, like the original Hillary, but still kind of brings like her own flavor and attitude. And you can very much tell she's supposed to be like very Gen Z and young, but she doesn't do it in a corny way. It feels really natural. So I do appreciate that. And I think that was probably the most natural fit of the casting. I was like, okay, I see it. I vibe with it. I understand it. Mm -hmm. As a chocolatey, I would say I'm like a caramel nugget or something. (laughs) As a caramel, I really appreciate that everyone is dark skinned and particularly because of how much wealth they have. And I think it is really delightful for me to see people of a darker skin tone who are one, members of their community, but also people who have done financially well for themselves. I agree with Elise. I'm a huge fan of Coco Jones. I first saw Coco Jones on the Terrell show on YouTube. That woman is a powerhouse. I mean, she performed for Terrell's One Million show and she performed Get It Together by 702. And she is a mood board. She is a mood board in and of herself. You can make an entire mood board off of Coco Jones. and I just love the Hillary character because she has a really strong sense of self. And I think in the original, Hillary didn't have that much dimension. But mm. now as she's been reimagined in this new story, she is very self-assured. She has a clear skill set. Remember she was a weather girl and she like, <laughs> in the original, she didn't know anything about the weather. Right. And this Hillary has her own special spice that it takes four hours to make. Now that's a woman who knows what she's talking about, <laughs> what she's passionate about. It's very, very exciting. And I also really do enjoy Carlton. I think he just looks so regal on screen. The way they're shooting him, the the darkness of his skin. He looks absolutely fantastic. It's not often that we see a predominantly dark skin cast on a major TV show such as this one. And I hope that it opens doors for more of that. Mm -hmm. 
Agreed. Yeah, I agree with all of what you all are saying. And I think is the the main character's name Jabari? Is that his name? The person who plays Will? He is a star. I feel like they got that casting spot on because he feels like he has some of that jovialness and like playful nature that Will had when the first series came out. So I really enjoy his character and I'm looking forward to seeing like how they all grow throughout the season. So let's get into some of the more particular storylines of each of the characters. So we've already talked a little bit about Hillary and like this reimagining of her. Like you mentioned, Frida, she was a weather girl in the first series. And now she is what appears to be like a cooking influencer. And it seems like there's some tension between this idea, which I don't necessarily remember in the first series. So y'all correct me if I'm wrong. I don't remember there being so much pressure for her to figure her life out. But in this reimagining, like she clearly knows what she wants to do, but there's tension between her and mom around maybe wanting her to do something more serious. You hear her talking about taking a gap year, which it turns out she has really decided she's not necessarily going back to college. So there is the tension between mom and daughter of mom wanting her to do something a little bit more traditional versus being an influencer. I think in the original series, they definitely touched on it that, oh, Hillary, you need to get your life together. You're grown. You need to move out. But it was definitely that like comedic trope of like bringing something up a thousand times and someone never does it. Mm. I do enjoy seeing Hillary be really like autonomous. And I think her character and her relationship with her mom kind of teases out a very Gen Z millennial trope that's like, oh, we want our own jobs and we want to work on our terms and we want to take the non-traditional route. But then you have your parents who they only know the traditional route. And so they're like, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And so I think that is a really realistic portrayal of someone her age, kind of like, yeah, I didn't like school. I found this other thing that I love and this other thing that I love, I can really see it sustaining me. And she does seem like she will be sustained. I think we don't know how many followers she has, but if she has millions of followers clapping back at that company, then she can definitely make something for herself. So I think just as like a younger person, it is good to see like, oh, there is a character on TV who's like, I'm not going to go to college. I'm going to do my own thing, but it's actually working. And then in 2020, 2021, we saw a lot of conversations around food media being racist. And so I thought that was a really good touch point that they put in there. Like, yeah, these food companies, their audience does look a certain way. People are diluting their recipes for X, Y, Z reason. And we know the reason for white audiences. So I thought that was really smart to put in there because that is a real conversation happening now. I am very intrigued by Hillary and on Vivian's relationship because of how Hillary challenges her mother about following your dreams. And it seems as though Vivian Banks also was that girl in her respective field, that she was very, very popular. And although social media didn't exist at the time, she had a following and that she decided to transition her life into a different direction. What I enjoyed so far is that they really do have conversations. So when Hillary said, oh, well, like you, when you just stop doing your art, does that mean that you really cared? And then her mom took the deep breath, which I would advise a lot more Black mothers to do. Take the deep breath when you want to hit the child. She took the deep breath and she said, you know what, Hillary, I'll support you no matter what you choose. Hillary also, I could see she felt bad when she said that. But I really do enjoy the fact that the mother is really trying to do her best to give Hillary her space. Hillary's also trying to do her best to figure out what she wants to do in her life. And at least that they're able to have this dialogue because at least in my personal experience, when I told my mom that I was not going to go to law school and instead I wanted to be a comedian and a podcaster, she did not hold her breath. She lost the breath. (laughs) And that can cause a lot of strife in a relationship, right? And so it just makes me happy to see how parents and children can figure out how to have these kinds of difficult conversations without people blowing up. But I think there has to be a way for our generation to coexist and support each other in the way that we want to live our lives. And I do think that their dynamic is giving us a bit of a pathway to see how that can happen. 
Y'all bring up such great points. I don't even know where to start. So one, <laughs> just just so much to follow up on. So one, it is making me think, and I'd be curious, you've already shared a little bit. I'd be curious to hear from you, Elise, around these conversations you have with parents when you are deciding to follow a maybe not so traditional route. Because I'm thinking like my boys are eight and five and they are already talking about like being YouTubers. And you know what I mean? And so when they are of age, this will be a more traditional route to follow, right? So that is one piece that I'm thinking about. And the other thing I'm thinking about is just this idea that Aunt Viv had maybe similar aspirations as Hillary does right now, right? And maybe some of what's happening for Aunt Viv is that her not taking the chance is she's projecting that onto Hillary and Hillary actually taking the chance, right? And it feels like there's something that they have not revealed to us around why Aunt Viv has decided to give up her art. I'm guessing it's around like becoming a, a mom, right? Or, you know, it, it feels like there's a story there that maybe we will get later. But I think there is maybe some projection going on because Hillary is able to go after her dreams and aspirations in a way that maybe Aunt Viv was not. I really resonate with Hillary because when I graduated from college, I had a job, then I got laid off from my job. So I had about like an eight month period where I was just like doing my own thing. I was freelancing. And unlike Hillary, my mom was very supportive of it. She was like, you have to create your own job. You can't just wait for me to have your own job. So it was almost a little pushy to like get out there and do the non-traditional route. But I definitely have had questions from like other people who aren't my mom, like, oh, what are you doing? If you ever want to, um, my job is hiring. If you ever want to apply, kind of taking me working like in podcasting, not as seriously. And sometimes you just have to let your continued dedication to something be the proof that people need that is going to work out. Because of course, they're always, once you get a feature or, you know, you work on like a super big podcast, they're going to be like, okay, I get it now. Something they've heard before, something they see on the morning news, like, oh my goodness, what's the host of your podcast on the news? What? <laughs> like, they'll get it then. But sometimes that dedication, once people see like, you're not going to let your foot up, then they get it. And I think that moment in the show where Aunt Viv's friends are like, you go girl, like you stuck to it. She kind of for a second was like, wait, maybe Hillary was right. And so I think that's definitely going to be an interesting thing to play out over the season. But like you said, in about like 10 years, maybe even sooner, I don't think it'll be such a big shock when kids are like, I want to be a content creator. I have the tools already. I watch people do it. Let me just try and fail. And by trying, you get views, you get followers, you fail upwards and you learn upwards. And I think right now for creators, there are a lot of resources out there with other creators talking about this is how you do this. So I'm glad they brought that up in the show. I think we'll definitely see that dynamic change over the next few years. So I agree with y'all that, you know, it was good for her to be able to show on the sorority sisters, you know, like, and then they backed Hillary up. The only thing I was a little like, I don't know how I feel about this is that on Viv had used her personal connections to get Hillary that shot. Right. And so it feels like there is a little bit of tension between how do you not ruin relationships, even if you don't feel like it was a good fit for you? Could there have been another way for her to go about that without blasting the company out on social? But it was also effective, right? So it just feels like that is, I think, one of those generational kinds of things that we will have to kind of wait and see and figure out, like, what's the best way to move forward for things like that that happen? I mean, when Aunt Viv's friend was at the party, the woman in the all off-white beige suit pulled up, I was sweating profusely because it sounds like this woman works in like the PR department at that. And so she could have lost her job. And that was very serious to me. And even when Hillary dropped the name, I literally turned to my partner. I said, she didn't do it. She didn't do it. She didn't say that. I thought that that was inappropriate. I thought that she could have picked another name. She could have made up some name or something, but I thought that that was inappropriate because your mom set up the interview for you. And also, you might want to work with the company later on because these companies, they have different people in these different departments. Hopefully, they can evolve and change over time. But to me, you, you burned the bridge, Hillary. You burned it and it's on fire and you don't walk, <laughs> you walk past it. 
Yeah, like I said, that is one of those things because like, could she have pitched a way to do that differently? But again, what she did was effective too, right? Even though she burned a bridge. So it feels like it's a weighing of like, okay, do I want to set all of this on fire and really make my own lane? Or is there a way to work within the existing system, which I think is something that, you know, I think especially like people her age struggle with, like, how do we burn it all down versus try to work with what we have? And we do know a lot of the systems we have are not really set up for our success. So in some cases, I think burning it down is the more effective route. But because there was a personal relationship with her mom, I think that's what made it a little trickier. So the other, it feels like the largest conversation that has been happening around a character on the show is around Carlton. So I do feel like he has been set up to be the villain in this reimagining of the show. And I found him mildly annoying, I think, in the original. But in this one, it is like you are actively rooting against him, which just lets me know, one, that the actor is amazing because you can't even separate him from the character. And it was so funny because I recently saw him like share a tweet that said, if y'all gonna hate on me, at least use the 4K version of my picture. Like... please stop using them pixelated pictures of me to hate on me, which I love. But it definitely seems like his character is just really strong and they have set up this dynamic that feels a little more intense to me than it did in the original. What are your thoughts about Carlton? Initially, I wasn't sure. However, the scene with Carlton and Connor, where Connor is saying, you know what, in the locker room, Carlton, you lost me. You lost me. I, I think though at the same time, Carlton, he seems so in distress, and I don't know why. So, for example, when he was really excited about that internship, and he was speaking to the older gentleman who he believed was on the board or what have you, he found out that person wasn't the person he needed to be speaking to. And then when he got home and his parents asked him about it, he said, I don't even want that internship anymore. And I'm just thinking, how do you go from wanting something so badly to totally throwing it away? I'm really concerned about Carlton because to me, he also doesn't really match his family. To me, he's not fitting in. Everyone else seems more like jovial and sweet and caring and thoughtful. And what we've seen of Carlton is just manipulative. And the whole scene he had with Will when he was speaking in front of the junior class and Will came up and he did that whole thing to embarrass him. I'm just thinking like, this is usually what I see of in like creepy white boy characters. Like very manipulative, strange white boy characters. And to see it on such a dark skinned black man, yes, this actor is excellent. Because I'm looking at him, I'm like, I'm afraid of you. I'm scared. <laughs> Cause I don't know what I don't know what he's capable of because I really can't understand what he's been through. And so Carlton is definitely giving villain vibes. And before he was sweet and lovable in the original. He was nerdy, but he was sweet and lovable. But this character is not It's hard to find the love right now. I definitely agree that it's hard to sympathize with Carlton (laughs) in almost any situation that we've seen so far. But I will say to your point about you're wondering like where some of his like angst and hurt comes from. I think that the show could do a better job at teasing out him being a black person in this like white space and then seeing Will come in And this is something we know from like the original series that will probably be teased down in this is that Will's going to be very popular and seeing Will be able to be himself and be very popular, not to say Carlton's not being himself, but to a degree, there has to be some assimilation and changing of who you are to like fit into that space. And I think that does come with a lot of pressure and then seeing an outsider come in and just do it so naturally. And so that's something that I'm waiting for the show to address is like Carlton is under a lot of pressure being the only black person in the space. He played lacrosse. I play lacrosse. I know it. It's not a a lot of black people (laughs) playing lacrosse, especially in California. Now on the East coast, maybe, but in California, I'm like, who is playing lacrosse? That's black for real. And so I can definitely understand, like I'm in the space. I want to fit in. I already know. I'm dark, I'm black, I'm going to stick out. How can I fit in? And then Will is new, so he's already going to be a target. And I think it does aid Carlton to kind of tease him and be the guy to pick on the new guy as opposed to saying like, hey, this is my cousin. He's from 
Philadelphia. He's definitely not from the burbs of LA. Let's include him. That might jeopardize his social status at the school. So I'm interested to see how the series kind of addresses that. And I think as they address that and as we know, his drug use, we might be able to have a little more sympathy for that character. That was beautifully stated. I did not once consider how hard Carlton's life has been as a very dark-skinned young boy and now young man in Bel Air. And I think you're totally right. I mean, remember he said in the episode to Lisa, Carlton's been doing this since he was in like elementary school. And so that's probably why I I can't relate because my elementary school, I had a bunch of black kids at the school. I didn't have to grow up around a predominantly white space, but if I did, how would I be different? How would it have made sense for me to assimilate or just try to figure out a way to fit in and make my life less difficult because I'm already other? I think that was really beautiful, Elise, and I had not considered that. Look at that. Yeah, I agree. I agree, Elise. That is spot on. And I feel like that is a part of what's happening. And I think the other piece is that we have to consider their age, right? So we know that there are Black people as adults, as grown adults, 30 plus, who value being the only one in a space, right? Like that feels very tragic to me, but we know it exists. And so it feels like that's a part of what we're seeing him struggle with, but he's also a child, right? So his brain is not even fully developed. So him grappling with something like that looks more like the manipulation and acting out that we see. The other thing that I think does give us an opportunity to have some sympathy for Carlton is that all of this happened so quickly, right? So we know that like Will was on a flight to Bel Air in 24 hours of the fight, right? And so what were the conversations with the kids around why Will is coming? It doesn't sound like they have the whole story because you see Carlton repeatedly say like, oh, we'll find out the real reason that you're here. And so it feels similar to what would happen when like there's a new baby in the house, So we know from all the research that there are all these things you're supposed to do to prepare kids for like a new sibling or a new child coming into the house, like helping them pick out nursery clothes and doing all of these things. And none of that has had a chance to happen in the past 24 hours. Now, of course, they're older, right? So he has a different understanding of someone new. But I think in any system, when you have been around a while and there's like a new person coming in, there could be some feelings of I'm not as special anymore or some feelings of abandonment, you know, and and it does seem like, especially in that, in the scene we see where Will has the basketball game the same night as Carlton has the lacrosse game and the parents say, okay, we're going to split our time. Well, that is clearly nothing Carlton has had to worry about before. And so now the attention from the parents has to be divided. And we see that, you know, it looks like Will's having a great game, so they don't actually even make it to Carlton's game. And so, you know, we see him blow up really over that. So a lot of this, I think, is just a really difficult transition. And it doesn't feel like the family has done the greatest job maybe of talking with the kids about what this change is going to mean and what their expectations are of Carlson. You know, it seems like they have some expectations that he's just going to take him in and show him around. But clearly those have not been voiced to Carlson, nor has he bought into this idea that he's supposed to be helping his cousin adjust to this new life. More from our conversation about Bel Air after the break. This segment is sponsored by Novo Nordisk. It's easy to get down on ourselves about our weight. That's because we tend to see weight regain or lack of weight loss as a personal failing. But it's important to take a step back and look at what is happening culturally around us. For instance, the pandemic. For the past year and some change, there have been so many new things to navigate. The kids have been home doing virtual school. Your dining room has become your office. And the things that you used to turn to for relaxation, like massages and working out at the gym, have largely been taken away. With so many changes and the anxiety of the pandemic, it's really easy to do things like snack because you're bored or stressed, chips are my go-to, or opt to watch your favorite show instead of going out for a walk. I'm sure you can relate to that. But the bottom line is, a lot of us struggled with taking care of ourselves because there was so much happening. And naturally, it led to weight gain and weight regain. Struggles related to a lack of access to healthy food make it more challenging to lose weight and maintain weight loss. When it's easier to get processed foods than fruits and vegetables, of course this will impact how you eat and ultimately your weight. But there's also a science behind weight loss and weight regain. When we lose weight, changes in our body's appetite hormones can make us feel hungrier. 
This causes us to eat more and regain the weight we lost. And it also makes weight management that much more difficult. So it's easy to feel stuck in a cycle of weight loss and regain. A great resource to learn more about this is truthaboutweight.com. In fact, people living with excess weight generally make seven serious attempts to lose weight over time. Seven. And while diet and exercise are our familiar go-tos and are important, they don't have to be and aren't the only parts of your weight loss plan. Weight management is much more complex than what we eat and how we move. It's physiology too. Probably more that than anything else. That's why it's important to partner with a healthcare provider to create a weight management plan that works for you. It should be someone you trust and someone you feel comfortable talking with. Because you shouldn't ever feel embarrassed about excess weight or let anyone else make you feel less than. To learn more about how to have that conversation with a doctor or nurse, visit truthaboutweight.com. That's truthaboutweight.com. Once you find a healthcare provider you feel comfortable with, you can work together to develop a weight management plan that is right for you. If you dream it, you can do it, right? If only self-fulfilling prophecies work for hiring for your team. When you partner with Indeed, building the right team is that simple. Indeed makes it easy to attract, interview, and hire all in one place. And Indeed is the only job site where you're guaranteed to find quality applications that meet your must-have requirements or else you don't pay. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites hoping to find candidates with the right skills, you need one powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. One of the things I love about Indeed is that it makes hiring all in one place so easy and more than 3 million businesses worldwide use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com therapy. Offer valid through March 31st. Go to Indeed.com therapy to claim your $75 credit before March 31st. Indeed.com slash therapy. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. This segment is sponsored by Novo Nordisk. It's easy to get down on ourselves about our weight. That's because we tend to see weight regain or lack of weight loss as a personal failing. But it's important to take a step back and look at what is happening culturally around us. For instance, the pandemic. For the past year and some change, there have been so many new things to navigate. The kids have been home doing virtual school. Your dining room has become your office and the things that you used to turn to for relaxation like massages and working out at the gym have largely been taken away. With so many changes and the anxiety of the pandemic, it's really easy to do things like snack because you're bored or stressed, chips are my go-to, or opt to watch your favorite show instead of going out for a walk. I'm sure you can relate to that. But the bottom line is, a lot of us struggled with taking care of ourselves because there was so much happening. And naturally, it led to weight gain and weight regain. Struggles related to a lack of access to healthy food make it more challenging to lose weight and maintain weight loss. When it's easier to get processed foods than fruits and vegetables, of course this will impact how you eat and ultimately your weight. But there's also a science behind weight loss and weight regain. When we lose weight, changes in our body's appetite hormones can make us feel hungrier. This causes us to eat more and regain the weight we lost. And it also makes weight management that much more difficult. So it's easy to feel stuck in a cycle of weight loss and regain. A great resource to learn more about this is truthaboutweight.com. In fact, people living with excess weight generally make seven serious attempts to lose weight over time. Seven. And while diet and exercise are our familiar go-tos and are important, they don't have to be and aren't the only parts of your weight loss plan. Weight management is much more complex than what we eat and how we move. It's physiology, too. Probably more that than anything else. That's why it's important to partner with a healthcare provider to create a weight management plan that works for you. It should be someone you trust and someone you feel comfortable talking with. Because you shouldn't ever feel embarrassed about excess weight or let anyone else make you feel less than. To learn more about how to have that conversation with a doctor or nurse, visit truthaboutweight.com. That's truthaboutweight.com. Once you find a healthcare provider you feel comfortable with, you can work together to develop a weight management plan that is right for you. Every five and a half minutes, a person in the U.S. dies of a drug overdose. Each of these deaths is tragic and preventable. There is an effective approach for protecting the health of people who use drugs and avoiding fatal overdose. This approach is called harm reduction. Just like wearing a seatbelt when driving a car, 
Harm reduction consists of common sense practices with big life-saving impacts. When it comes to drugs, harm reduction is proven to reduce overdose deaths while improving community health. Harm reduction includes things like access to sterile syringes to stop the spread of HIV and hepatitis C, access to naloxone to prevent fatal overdoses, and connecting people with vital services and information. It saves lives every day by helping people who use drugs protect and improve their health. Harm reduction doesn't require anyone to stop using drugs to get help. Instead, it provides judgment-free support and meets people wherever they are at today. Please visit supportharmreduction.org to learn more and share your memory of a loved one lost to overdose. Brought to you by Vital Strategies. So the other thing with Carlton, and I feel like, so there was one episode in the original show when Carlton accidentally took the drugs and Will got really scared that he was going to have an overdose or something. I can't quite remember all the details, but here we see that Carlton is actively using, I think Xanax, is that, is that what he said? But not like swallowing the pills, like he's snorting it. And so it feels kind of early to tell like what's happening there. It feels like some of it is a recreational kind of like, this is what the kids in his school do. But even after like the blow up on the lacrosse match, we see him like use the Xanax as a way of kind of coping, it feels like. And so it's kind of hard to tell whether this is a recreational kind of thing or whether there's like an abuse kind of problem here. But this is definitely like a new slant, right? Like this is not at all something that was in the original. So that is a plot line that they have added. What are your thoughts around like the drug use that we see with Carlton? The Carlton from the original show didn't drink, didn't smoke, and had a difficult time courting with the ladies. Okay, this Carlton in the reimagining, he is so chocolatey. When he was walking around campus and Lisa had to clean his nose, I said, now, hold on a second. You didn't see all that whiteness on your chocolatey nose to me. And Lisa said it first. I'm going to say it again. Carlton has a problem. If you are taking drugs after you were ejected out of a game and they're readily accessible for you in your locker room, you have a problem. If you're walking around campus with drugs on your nose, it can be seen. You have a problem. And I'm worried. He's doing drugs in his house where his mom and father and younger sister Ashley live. Definitely Carlton has a problem. And I think some of it could be a tribute to that pressure. Because from my understanding, Xanax like keeps you up, right? And keeps you going. And it's like, if you're the star lacrosse player trying to get into Princeton, then you have to deal with your new cousin's BS. You just got a lot going on. And obviously, I'm not happy that there's drug use, but I'm glad it's being addressed because I remember Euphoria came out. A lot of people were like, whoa, high school is doing drugs. And I'm over here like, y'all have not been to high school. (laughs) And I know like this has been happening, but people are so shocked. And I'm like, no, people of that age experience trauma, pressure, anxieties that does lead them to get drugs and whether their parents have a prescription or they know someone or they get it on like the black market, it is relatively accessible at that age if you have, what, $50 to get drugs. And so, no, we don't want to normalize the use, but we do want to like normalize that it is a problem that young people experience. So I'm glad they're showing that. And my prediction is that his relationship with Will will get better and Will is able to help him through that because we know Will comes from what I guess they're trying to portray as like the inner city and drugs are a little more accessible. They happen everywhere, but I bet Will, that character has seen someone struggle with it and can help Carlton in general deal with pressure because Will is a star basketball player, was at his school growing up around crime, having to deal with like beef and different stuff like that, just stay safe. And I think him and Carlton can hopefully like bond over that. And he can be like, this is not the only way that you have to deal with this. I have a question for the group. When they were at Connor's party and Will and Lisa were dancing and Carlton was looking at them, did Will and Lisa actually kiss or was Carlton hallucinating? So this was not something that I had thought much about. But again, in I've been so obsessed with the show that I'm like going through the hashtag on Twitter, right? And so Morgan actually answered this question because somebody else on Twitter asked the question and it was shot 
to look as if it was only from Carlton's vantage point. So they didn't actually kiss. It was only Carlton imagining that that was happening. So shout out to the cast and the crew for being so active on Twitter, answering all of our questions. So Lisa is not a main character, but she is clearly a very important character. Lisa appears to be Carlton's ex-girlfriend. And, you know, it seems like a new friend to Will, though it it will be interesting to see how this develops because clearly he has like a crush on her, right? And so I do think it's a little weird to be trying to go after your cousin's ex-girlfriend. So maybe they keep them as friends, but definitely there is some interest. But we also learned that Lisa's mom, who died, I think, maybe a few years ago in the show from Lupus, is also Aunt Viv's sorority sister. And so it sounds like this is somebody who has maybe been around the family even before she started dating Carlton. So I love her as a character. And I think that she is adding a nice flavor. Like you mentioned, Frida, you know, it definitely seems like she she and Carlton broke up maybe in part because of his drug use that maybe she felt like it was too difficult to try to like maybe keep help him to stop or or whatever but that she is still there for him in the background and will now more actively when Lisa jumped in the pool to save Will I said I gotta learn how to swim (laughs) because I mean if my man needs me in the ocean I need to be ready that was so sexy I said she was not only can she swim y'all She's strong enough to pull a young man out of the water. I'm impressed, Lisa. I'm impressed. I definitely like her. And I think it relates back to some of the situations we saw in the original Fresh Prince of Bel-Air where Will and Carlton, I would say they were competing over girls because they definitely had different leagues. But (laughs) there was definitely (laughs) tension like, oh, Will has a date and I don't. Or here's Will going out again. Because I've been searching, like, what are going to be, like, the funny points? I guess it can be really sad for Carlton to see your cousin trying to get at your ex-girlfriend. But I hope we see a little more, like, playful rivalry when it comes to, like, dating. Because I think that could be a really good, like, lighthearted thing. Great points there. So, you know, the other thing that I think we can talk about here is that we don't see Ashley very much in the first couple of episodes, which also feels similar to kind of like how her character was in the original, though, as she grew up, I think we got more storylines from her. But it feels like in the fourth episode, I think the most recent episode, we did see a little bit more storyline around her wanting to kind of meet up with her friends and those kinds of things. But it, it feels too soon to tell, really what's going to be Ashley's kind of main storyline besides trying to make friends. And she's very sheltered and very protected, right? And especially as dad is running for DA, we know that probably means that she is even more sheltered now because, you know, nobody wants anything to happen to her. But it does feel like her storyline has been minimal up until this point. I'm excited for the Ashley character as she was my favorite character in the original. I don't remember the Ashley from the original series played by Tatiana Ali really coming into her own until she had her 13th birthday. Mm. And so I wonder, and when Tevin Campbell performed, what a moment. So I wonder how old this Ashley is in this reimagining. And then perhaps if that 13th birthday is going to be a marker for her development into young womanhoodness and what have you. I Mm. think Right now, what's cool about the Ashley in the reimagining is that she seems similar to the Ashley from the original. She seems a baby activist. When Mm. she heard how Hillary was standing up for herself, she had a point of view and she was backing her older sister up. And so I think being that the Hillary character is more developed now, I'm really interested to see how Ashley and Hillary as sisters bond and how we see them play out on the screen. I think one of my favorite parts of the original Fresh Prince of Bel-Air was Will and Ashley's relationship. Mm. It was just really cute. And I remember being really young and having like older male cousins. I have a younger brother, but not an older brother. It was like, oh my goodness, I have a big brother. He's not a dad. So it's not like you can really reprimand me, but he's just cool. And so I can already see that the Ashley character might have a similar relationship. We haven't seen too much of it, but from what you said, Freya, she found what Hillary did just really cool. And she was like, yeah, like, right on. I really did enjoy seeing that dynamic. It always warms my heart. So I hope we get there. 
that they have a little bond. Mm -hmm. Like everyone uses the meme or the gif of them dancing in the room. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) That's my favorite. Yeah, I agree, Elise. I definitely love that relationship that they had too. And it definitely feels like Will and Hillary are having more of that. Like, I don't remember that as much in the original. And so it feels like in this reimagining, at least for now, the relationship that it seemed like he had with Ashley in the original is more of what he's having with Hillary right now. You know, it's still very early. We're still in the very first season. Hopefully they get renewed for a second season so we can see more of this play out. But I agree that that was something that I really love from the original as well. So we can talk about Aunt Viv and Uncle Phil together as a couple. So they give me very much President First Lady Obama vibes, especially Aunt Viv. Like she feels very much like she could play Michelle Obama in like a movie at some point. So I love like them as a couple. It feels like they have really great chemistry. But again, like I mentioned earlier, I am interested in hearing more of this storyline because even with her sorority sisters, it seems like there was conversations about like how her star was supposed to take off, right? Like she's clearly this brilliant artist and like had shows and, you know, and at some point the decision was made for her to kind of take a step back from that. And so I don't know if it was her becoming a mother, if as a couple they decided that it would be his career that would kind of be in the front, which seems a little interesting to me given time, right? Because I don't know how old they're supposed to be in this show, but they're clearly not from the like the 40s and 50s right and so it seems like time wise they would have been like 80s 90s maybe maybe 2000s <laughs> depending on the ages right and so to me it seems like there were more choices that women were making in terms of like being able to balance career and family so it seems interesting that that she felt the need to kind of make a choice of her art versus the family but again it feels like they're alluding to something that we will find out later I mean, if Hillary went to college and then has been in her gap year for two years, she's about 21 years old, which means she was born in 2000. I think what I'm thinking about right now, truly, is when we saw flashbacks of Aunt Viv and Uncle Phil in the original, right? And they were in the activist time with the Black Panthers and putting up their Black fists. Will we be able to see how this Aunt Viv and this Uncle Phil developed their relationship, began their family? There was an episode in the original where we saw them go to the first apartment that they had, right, where they actually began in L.A. And so I think it is interesting to think about in the year 2000, what would have been the rationale or the stakes that would have led to Anviv becoming a teacher at this time? And what would have been the rationale for that? Yeah, because in the original, Anviv is a professor, right? Like we see she still has a very active career and thus far it doesn't feel like anything outside of the home has really been developed for this Aunt Viv. Clearly, she's not really actively painting anymore. And it it sounds like there is some volunteerism and philanthropy maybe related to the sorority and other things in the community. But it doesn't seem like she has like some nine to five or like some career, so to speak, like a professor like the original Aunt Viv did. So I I, I mentioned that she was teaching art. Oh, did was she? Was she? Yeah, but... Right. But to your point, it does seem like the original Aunt Viv was very esteemed. It was Mm. like, oh, no, she's a professor. Don't mess with her. Like this one, it does seem like she's and not that it's a bad thing, just a bit more domestic and has like traded her career for her family. I do agree that it does just feel a bit dated considering where we are and considering like the age of their children. So I am curious to see like why. That is because you can already tell there's a story behind it just by the way she looks at the art, how people mention it. So I know we're going to get it. I'm just curious to the why. As you all were talking, it reminded me that in the original, the passion that was put to the side for the dark skin on Viv was dancing. Mm -hmm. And then we got that iconic moment in the studio where she, you know, had to let the people know what she was about. And so I'm sure we'll talk about this later, but I would love to see a gallery show in this season for on Viv. I would love to see that. I think that that would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, we already see them clearing a space for her new like painting, right? So it's clear that is in the storyline to kind of bubble up her doing more painting. So it'll be interesting to see how much of that we see, at least in this first season. So the other thing that I couldn't quite remember, but clearly we have a Fresh Prince of Bel-Air historian with us on the call. (laughs) So to me, 
in the like intro meeting between Uncle Phil and Will, like some of those first scenes with him in this reimagining felt more tense than I think I remember the original feeling, right? So again, you know, they already have three children. So I would imagine the decision to bring another 16, 17 year old, however old Will is, is not an easy one. But it feels like there was a little bit more tension around the decision for him to come to Bel Air than I remember from the original. Do y'all have any rememberings of that? I agree. I think the most tension we got was Carlton. And I think, yeah, Uncle Phil, he was always stern. But this Uncle Phil was grudgeful. I'm like, (laughs) why you agree to it if he was going to act like this from the jump? Like, not even be welcoming. And I do see, like, the stress of the campaign adding to that. Because I do remember, and free to correct me if I'm wrong, the original Uncle Phil also had like a campaign, but it was like later in the series. So it wasn't Will coming up and being Will during the campaign. So I get it. In the first like two episodes, I was like, can you cut him some slack? Like, you know what he's been through. Like, yeah, you can be hard. Like, this isn't what should be going on. You know, I wanted him to give him more grace because it's like, the environment where he's from, that is a very realistic thing to happen, really in a lot of environments. And he's what, is he supposed to be like 16, 17? So yeah, I'm like, this man is way too grudgeful for me. We're seeing a better side of him get teased out. But I do feel like, well, it was also a straight comedy from the jump. And the original Uncle Phil and Will, they were cool. It wasn't like, oh, you're here and I don't want you to be here. That was just Carlton. So different. Yeah, in the first episode in the original that I remember, Carlton and Will really go back and forth about immediately what is Blackness, who is Black, who is not Black. This Uncle Phil, the thing that was most jarring to me as someone who watched the original, in the reimagining, we see on Vivian and Uncle Phil talking about sending Will back. And that's not something that I remember from the original at all. And it was I think maybe what in the first or the second episode, they're like, he can't come correct. We're going to send him back. And I think that's where a lot of the tension and the drama from Uncle Phil really came for me because everything else had been not so direct, more passive. We're not sure how he really feels about him. And then, but when he finally opens his mouth, he's like, we can send this young man back home. And that was tough to, to see because that's harsh. Right. Especially given the circumstances, right? Like, you know what you would be sending him back to. So I agree that felt very harsh and like, you know, again, a departure from the original. But again, they have taken some liberties because this is a reimagining, right? So it didn't have to be a carbon copy. I just thought that that was interesting that they showed more of him not necessarily being as welcoming as I maybe kind of remembered from the original. More from our conversation about Bel Air after the break. On February 26th on BET. Hello, beautiful black people! Celebrate the beauty of black culture. It's a night to remember. The 53rd NAACP Image Awards, hosted by Anthony Anderson. The double A in NAACP stands for Anthony Anderson. Honoring top nominees Kevin Hart, Angela Bassett, Silk Sonic, Issa Rae, Forrest Whitaker, Queen Latifah, Billy Porter, Halle Berry, Mahershala Ali, Jasmine Sullivan, and more. Plus, we're honoring Chairman Awards recipient Samuel L. Jackson and Social Justice Impact Award recipient Nicole Hannah-Jones. What an incredible night. Our night, our best, our brightest. Honoring Black Excellence. It's the Image Awards on BET. The 53rd NAACP Image Awards, Saturday, February 26th at 8 on BET, where Black excellence lives. Since signing the 15% pledge in 2020, Macy's has tripled the number of Black-owned brands they carry. Now at Macy's, you can find the adorable Puzzle Huddle puzzles or the beautiful jewelry from Kendi Amani or Oma the Label. They are committed to using their purchasing power to represent and benefit the Black community. Macy's is celebrating Black creators and visionaries who are building legacy and influencing culture and style. Join in supporting Black history and Black brilliance by shopping Black-owned brands. And you can help fund scholarships for students at historically Black colleges and universities by donating online and rounding up in store for the UNCF. Learn more at Macy's.com slash honors. Hi, I'm Glory Adam, host of Well-Read Black Girl. 
Each week, I sit in close conversation with one of my favorite authors of color and share stories about how they found their voice, honed their craft, and navigated the publishing world and composed some of the most beautiful and meaningful words I've ever read. We journey together through the cultural moment where art, culture, and literature collide and pay homage to the women whose books we grew up reading. And of course, I check in with members of the Well-Read Black Girl Book Club. It's a literary kickback you never knew you needed. And you're all invited to join the club. So tell your friends to tell their friends so we can be friends who love books. Listen to Well-Read Black Girl on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. So the other thing that I thought was really interesting with Uncle Phil's character was this scene where we see him at the picnic, right, with his fraternity brothers. So one, I know this is not a show that like maybe as many people are watching as Insecure, but I definitely did not see the uproar on the timeline around the alphas and their letters and all kinds of stuff being shown as when the AKAs or the letters were on Tiffany in Insecure. So I don't know if they were more involved because this was extensive, right? Like in Insecure, it was almost like a flash. This was like very clearly a whole production. So my guess is that like the alphas were super involved. So that was my one thought. But that conversation or that line around that thinking similar to when he was on the radio interview with Big Boy around like how steeped into the community has Uncle Phil been really since undergrad it seems like fraternity brothers are saying they haven't seen him it sounds like somebody had fallen on tough times and like they didn't know where uncle phil was or he didn't even know this has happened and so it seems like there's this undercurrent of like have you still been really connected to blackness maybe and to your community in the ways that are meaningful to people on the alpha tip my partner is an alpha and i turned to him i said this is what y'all be doing (laughs) I don't know if what Uncle Phil performed was an official alpha sanctioned or certified piece of choreography. So I'm not sure if that was the stamp of approval for them. But my partner seemed very happy. And he's one person, obviously, but he seemed very happy to get the representation. And then to Uncle Phil's defense, I thought that what he said in response to the reverend, he said, do you want me to apologize for making a life for my family or for pursuing success? And I thought that was a really great piece of language to try to identify, are we punishing people for the pursuit of success? And if that's not the case, how do we want to encourage people to show up for our communities? Because when Uncle Phil arrived, he just got the cold shoulder. You know, the reverend wasn't happy to see him really like that. And it doesn't seem like in the times when maybe Uncle Phil was taking the time to do what he needed, that anybody was reaching out to him either to check in on him, right? And we know that sometimes, oh, yeah, they're good. They got money. They have a wife. They have kids. They're fine. We don't need to check in on them. So I just wonder sometimes how do we have those conversations where like, hey, I needed you to show up for me. I needed you to show up for this community in this way. Can you do that? I don't feel like Uncle Phil has been given the opportunity to turn things down. It's more so people are expecting him to help everyone at the same time. And it's like, that's actually not how time and space work. I thought that was definitely very interesting to see his relationship with his fraternity brothers and for them to question his commitment to the community. And I think that's something I imagine comes up a lot as you, you know, move to like a different socioeconomic status. How do you stay connected with not necessarily the people who helped you get there, but the people who are your like foundation and who, you know, you built memories with or who you just network with, because I mean, that's what a fraternity and sorority is too, like a networking opportunity. And so I could understand his fraternity brothers kind of feeling used, like we haven't seen you in 10 years. And now that you're running for something here, you are popping up. You you could have been helping out with X, Y, Z, but you haven't. But at the same time, it's like, Sometimes as people transition throughout life and whether that means, you know, getting a new job, making more money, moving somewhere, especially if it's a good thing, people are like, oh, they don't need us or like, oh, they're doing that thing over there. They don't check in like Frida said. So 
I'm interested to see like how that's going to play out, especially in terms of his campaign and people kind of continuing to question, you live in Beverly Hills, but now you want our support, but we don't know you. So I think it'll be interesting. Yeah. And of course, you know, it's a TV show. It's on NBC Peacock. So of course, there's going to be this after school resolution feel. But I did think it was very funny. And I don't think that this is how this would happen in real life. It's like he does one step and now y'all welcome him back into the fold. (laughs) Right? Like that's not... (laughs) <laughs> that's not how that's gonna happen because he you know knew a, a chant you know but of course again it's it's a tv show so there needed to be some resolution but to your earlier point Frida going back to Carlton you know we see all this happen with him trying to get the internship and so I hadn't thought about that but I wonder what happened there one we know that the guy that he talked to wasn't actually the chair anymore. And so he was going to have to put him in touch with other people. But I also wonder if his mind changed because Will was such a star at the step show part of it, right? So it almost felt like Will was instrumental and he was in like getting the crowd to turn in favor of Uncle Phil. And so, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens, like why he wasn't any longer interested in that internship. Was it just because he didn't want to have to talk to a new person or was he in his feelings about the way Will showed up at the step show? Well, I think it was definitely, once again, this feeling of being replaced and that Will is being the star and infringing onto his life. But also more specifically, the older gentleman that he was playing chess with, He said that the person who is now head of the organization that Carlton wanted to intern with was the man in the yellow shirt who asked them to get the chairs out. And Carlton had had said some slick stuff to him. And he was like, "Mm, I I, I probably should just walk away. So... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> good point I forgot about that yeah because he did not actually help so it's like I can't give you no good recommendation because you wouldn't even help unload the chairs <laughs> very good point very good point there so it'll be interesting to see how all of that continues to unfold so let us maybe talk about Jeffrey before we talk about Will so we will just start with what everybody is thinking is this is a gorgeous character <laughs> I'm saying <laughs> If we get a chance to meet the cast and do an interview in real person, it could be a problem. Yeah, so gorgeous casting here, clearly. And I love, like, they have reimagined this character in some ways that I think are very cool and fresh and, like, add this dimension. So he's clearly much younger than the original Jeffrey. And what is his title? Like, the house manager, I think, is his title now. So he is who meets Will fresh off of his drop-off from Jazz and clearly is kind of, like, running things, but also has this, like, really interesting relationship with Uncle Phil that definitely feels like it is beyond house manager. So I'm very interested in seeing, you know, especially after what we saw in episode four of the show, right, about what's happening and how he has connects to Philly. And, you know, Will says, I'm I'm struggling because this guy has now found out that I'm in California. And Jeffrey is like, I'll take care of it. Right. And so I really want to hear what is the backstory for Jeffrey and more about his relationship with Uncle Phil. I love how they really added a cool factor to Jeffrey. When Will tried to sneak out of the house and Jeffrey leaned over Jazz's car, I was like, it feels like he has eyes and ears on everything. And I think that's particularly cool because he's international. So it seems like he's from the UK, but by way of one of the islands, because you can hear both accents bouncing in between when he's speaking. And he just exudes what I feel like is international coolness, international suaveness. Yeah, I just, I'm really, I'm really into his character. I wouldn't be surprised if whatever ties Uncle Phil has to perhaps the underworld or the other side of, of the coin that Jeffrey is connected to that. Because the way that they were playing pool and drinking their dark liquors, I'm like, there's something here. They really feel like a true partnership. And I think that we saw that sometimes in the original, for example, when Jeffrey and Uncle Phil in the original went to go play pool and get Will out of trouble at the pool hall that episode. So like, to me, that was one of my favorite Jeffrey episodes because Jeffrey is hella cool. And so now they're really highlighting that. And it's just very wonderful. It's very exciting. 
I agree with everything you're saying, Frida. I do love how they added that he's from like an island. I think that was like really cool. I always thought the original Jeffrey was cool and was rooting for Will. He had to have that like British shade. Like they had to have it in there. And so it's nice to see him be even cooler and less like strict and proper and more like, I'm gonna just tell you about yourself on the side and we're gonna leave it at that. But I'm gonna have your back always. Overall, I think it's a lot of people being hard on <laughs> the the Will character. So it's nice to see him like supporting him and just trying to make sure he's good. I guess that's obviously the job of the house manager, but it goes beyond Just like, do you need your bags picked up or do you need water or coffee or whatever? And so I'm very curious to see what is really his relationship with Uncle Phil. Like, did they go through some ish? Like, I need the tea on that immediately. (laughs) Immediately. Send us a a copy of the script, please. (laughs) Screener. Screener. (laughs) My question, though, is, at least to me, again, Jeffrey seems like he has a hold of the house. He knows what's going on. At the same time, does he really not know that Carlton has a drug problem? Mm. That is a good point. I mean, given what we've seen, how he nothing gets past him, right? Like, because he clearly knew where Ashley was, even though she was supposed to be with Hillary at the record store, right? So it would be kind of shocking if he didn't know. And so I wonder if maybe it's just something that we have not seen yet, like how he's tried to intervene or maybe he's trying to like do something behind the scenes without getting the parents involved. Although that doesn't seem like something you would not tell the parents. But you're right. You bring up a really good point for you to like, if he knows all this stuff, like how could Carlton really be like using all these drugs under the roof without him knowing? Good point. Something to think about. So again, I hadn't even thought about the callback to the pool scene, right? In the original. So there are all these little Easter eggs, I think is what people call them, right? About the original, that it makes sense in the reimagining, but it is a nice callback to those who did watch the original, who clearly watch it as much as you, Frida, that you pick up on all of those things. So I just think that is so cool that they make those kinds of tie-ins that make sense, but it's also just a very nice touch for people who really love the original. The other thing that I love is the incorporation of jazz. So I love that they also have some of that same, like, oh, what's going to happen between him and Hillary? Because we know that he had a huge crush on Hillary in the original. And so I love that it feels like more of a mutual thing is popping off between them, at least initially in this reimagining. And I love the jazz character. I love that he is kind of like Will's lifeline and like out from the family and kind of keeps him connected to the cooler parts of Bel Air, I guess. So I really like how they are using that character and making him a part of the scenes. I was always rooting for Jazz and Hillary in the original. (laughs) I am elated about the idea about Hillary and Jazz, if that were to happen, I think that that would be really smooth. If, you know, if, if they're complimentary to each other. Yes. I don't know if I was playing on my phone. How did Will end up getting a ride from Jazz in the first place? Dr. Joy, I have this exact same question. I don't know what I was doing. I don't know if I was in the kitchen. Elise, please tell us, you know, please. I don't know either. I remember watching it and I was like, did he just see another car? And like, I was so confused. Yeah. Like how? I mean, well, well, Jazz did have a card. And so I wonder if he was kind of like at the airport as like a taxi mm-hmm. kind of thing and saw Will and said, oh, I can take you because he did give him a card that said something like personal transportation or something. Right. Because clearly Jeffrey and the family had made other plans for his ride. And then he shows up with Jazz. So I wonder if he was just kind of waiting and saw Will and said, oh, I can take you. OK, so we didn't miss anything. They just never made that clear. <laughs> as a way to introduce jazz or we all consistently miss it we were all on our phones at the exact same time (laughs) trying to trying to tweet and watch at the same time (laughs) so let us get into the main character there's so many wonderful characters it feels like you don't even have to talk all about will which i think is also cool but definitely this reimagining of will i think there are some real close ties to the original but we also see like this fresh twist with who he is just so many things it seems like he will be dealing with as this season unfolds so again we've already talked about it was less than 24 hours probably by the time he had this fight and he's on 
a plane to California. And so I'm, I'm imagining there's some grief related to like having to let go and leave his old life in such a quick place. He didn't even have a chance to say goodbye. Then we find out that his friend Trey has been shot after he left. And so there's some guilt it feels like he's dealing with, you know, because he feels like they're out to get me basically. And But Trey is the one who's left trying to fit into this new environment that feels very foreign to him. It feels like basketball was clearly his thing. And now he has to like try out for the team and, you know, like the place that really gave him solace and allowed him to shine. It feels like was going to be a bit of a difficult thing for him, but he was able to humble himself enough to try out and clearly on the team. And so I think that there will be a lot of like transitions and transitions that we've already seen with his character as the season continues to unfold. So can I call out another Easter egg? Yeah. The Easter egg is that Alan Payne played a character in The Fresh Prince where he was a basketball player competing in the Bel Air Academy League. And he's the only other Black player in the league. And Will and him are like competing, I think, for a top tier spot to be recruited for a, a university. And Alan Payne's character has a child and Will ends up letting, I'm putting up air quotes, letting Alan Payne's character win because he's like, you know what, like, I'm going to toss the game because I want this guy to go and have a future in college and play and I'll be okay. I'm pretty sure the Black character that Will speaks to during the game in the reimagining where he said, you really from Hollywood, whatever he said, he said, you really from whatever his jersey says. And then the black guy in the reimagining says, are you really from Bel Air? Will laughs and then he like takes off and does a layup. I'm pretty sure that's the same character. <laughs> you think that that is the Lance character or the son? I think that's the Lance character. Yeah. Okay. So that character, that character in the reimagining, he's from Malibu. The other character is from Malibu. And I think uh- that's him. Look at that. See, not many recap conversations are going to have the benefit of a historian like we do. (laughs) I was like, I didn't know all that. (laughs) I am reminded now that you say it, but I definitely did not remember it in real time. (laughs) So what are your thoughts about um, this reimagining Elise of Will? First of all, I love, love just the actor and like the energy he brings. I think the casting was spot on. He does have that same energy that Will Smith had playing Will in the original. Just very friendly. He's tall. So I'm like, the casting's perfect. The acting is really good. I am definitely excited to see how he starts to like acclimate to the school just because I feel like to a degree in the original Carlton was a little more on his side a little more open to like showing him things yeah they had tension but this Carlton as we said he is the villain he's preying on Will's downfall so I'm interested to see how he's gonna because I'm predicting that he'll eventually be like popular and have a lot of friends but how that's gonna play out I think something that is really real and almost really heartbreaking is like having to know that somebody's looking for you, but that you kind of left home and things are better for you now. And of course he has family and there's privilege in that situation. But I know a lot of people will resonate with that story as kids who go to college and their friends don't, and they're kind of in a new environment. My brother, one of his friends like was killed while he was away, like on a trip or something. And I was like, wow, like this is such a real thing. Like you go on to other opportunities whether it's just for like a weekend trip or going to college or, you know, starting a new job and you have people who are quote unquote left at home. And so kind of having to deal with that trauma and just that anxiety, it's like, is my mom going to be okay? Cause she's a single mom. Are my friends going to be okay? Are the people back home going to forget about me? Are they going to think I'm a sellout? And so I definitely think it's going to be interesting to see like, will grapple with that, especially as he, you can already tell he kind of views Carlton as like a sellout and uncle Phil as like, okay, they're removed from what's really going on. It's like, well, now you're in that position. So how are you going to handle that? So I think it's going to be interesting. And what I think we also see more of the tension, which is part of the reimagining of back home in Bel Air before we didn't really see any of Philadelphia or what he, you know, the original will was going through like, yeah, his father came and yeah, his mom came and some other family, but that's really all we knew. 
That's such a good point. You're right, at least. Like, we didn't really see very much about, like, the aftermath of what happened after he left in Philadelphia. So it'll be interesting to see if mom comes to visit, because we know that that was, like, a key part. Like, she would have pretty frequent, I would say, visits in the original. So I'm looking forward to the first visit. And it seems like there's something between the sisters. And again, I don't remember much about the original, but it definitely didn't seem like there was tension. And in this one, there's feeling like there is some tension. Now, granted, the call that we see between Will's mom and Carlson's mom is around Carlson having pushed her child in the in the pool. So of course that's going to be a tense conversation, but it also feels like maybe something else is there, right? And so again, I'm just interested to see if maybe she does a visit when there's some conversation between um, Viv and Will's mom. The other thing that I did not initially pick up on, but that I am interested to see how plays out is like the flashbacks that Will is having related to the incident with the police. And I think that that is very timely and it seems like it's being very well done. So I'm always on the lookout of like, is the therapist going to be involved? Are they going to have him see a therapist? You know, because the flashbacks he's having are consistent with what we might see with like a PTSD diagnosis, right? So this idea that something traumatic has happened to you or someone else in your life. And then you have these flashbacks of the scene or the experiences he has whenever he sees like somebody in uniform or a person in authority very much feel like what we might see with a PTSD diagnosis. Now, of course, it's very early to to tell. And, you know, he doesn't have multiple symptoms, at least at this point that we've seen. But I think it will be interesting to see like how they continue to play out that storyline. And like, who is he going to tell? When is an adult going to know that he's experiencing this? Similar to the drug use, right? It it definitely feels like there are these mental health storylines that are bubbling under the surface. And so it'll be interesting to see like when an adult gets involved. To your point, it does seem like he tried to bring it up to Uncle Phil when he was playing basketball. He was like, have you ever been like detained or anything he was like no and I think he's saying yeah he did say like this is the reason I've been off my game and so hopefully they'll push that like a little deeper because it definitely is the reason it definitely just you kind of see him freeze up when he ran away from the guard he just doesn't know how to handle that situation because before it was just not a good situation they were slamming on the ground he was like my arm my arm so That'll definitely be interesting to see. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if this is will be a situation where we see some follow up from Lisa, because we also see the other incident where he has one of these flashbacks is when he runs into Lisa's dad in the restroom. And we find out that he is like the chief of police for LAPD. Right. And so then he kind of like has this, you know, altercation with Lisa. Like, why didn't you tell me your dad was a cop kind of thing? And she's like, well, it didn't even come up, you know. So I think that there will probably be some follow up conversation between them and maybe he will share with her what's happening but I definitely would love to see talking to someone about that because definitely we see how it's playing out right and that he's having trouble focusing you know and he's having the flashback so I would just love to see how that plays out as the season continues. I think it's really powerful that the show is showing us visually what it's like to have these flashbacks what they look like and how they can manifest in real life because there are things that I wouldn't even have thought about as someone who's never been arrested. And when I watched the flashbacks Will was having in the reimagining, I asked someone I love who I know has been involved in the past with the police. And I said, have you ever experienced like flashbacks where you're just doing something and then you feel like you're transported back to that experience with the police? And they told me yes. And I had no idea. Yeah, you're right. I always think it's helpful, especially when it's well done, right? When you can see something and then you have language for this thing that you didn't even know existed. You know, and I think for so long, conversations around like PTSD were only associated with like war, right? And we know that people have very traumatic experiences, especially Black people dealing with the police. And so I think looking at that kind of framework and especially given what we know Will may have seen interacting with the police with other friends or other people in Philadelphia I think that that probably is adding to what the stress he's experiencing related to these flashbacks as well right and then he already knows that he is the unfamiliar black kid in the school and so even before he got to school you know there was a fight video so they already have these preconceived notions of him and so I think anyone in that situation you're aware that, yeah, people view me like this. So I do have to keep my guard up to a degree. And so I think 
that's like another like added element of some of the stress he's experiencing. Are there any resources you would share for people who think that they may be experiencing symptoms of PTSD or having those kinds of intense flashbacks, Dr. Joy? Mm, Yeah, we've had a couple of really good conversations here on the podcast. So in session 104 with Jason Phillips, we talked about prolonged exposure therapy, which is one of the treatments that is often used to help people who are struggling with PTSD. So that would be a good episode to check out. As well as session 25, we talked about what in the world is EMDR with Kelly Davis. EMDR is another treatment that is often used to help people with symptoms of PTSD. So both of those would be great episodes to check out. And they had lots of great resources they shared in those episodes. I was just going to say, I think Will's mom shared a really beautiful affirmation in the episode where Will called his mom and said, he was like complaining about the situation. And then his mom said, think about where you were yesterday and look at where you are now. Mm. And I, when I heard it, I wrote it down because I do think that is an important affirmation to have in your back pocket. Think about where you have been. And then when you are feeling low, look at your surroundings of what you've been able to accomplish or been gifted or been able to access in your life at times when you are feeling overwhelmed, sad, what have you. I think it's just, I thought it was just a really short, but very deep thing to add to your wellness package. Mm, I like that. Yeah, I love that. And that's why I'm also hoping we get to see more of her because I really love her interactions with Will. So we've already gotten into some of this, but what are your predictions for what we might see? So, you know, they gave us the first three episodes on Super Bowl Sunday and from here on out, they are weekly releases on Thursdays. And so, you know, there are 10 episodes that we're going to get in this first season. And again, hopefully we get renewed for a second season. But what are your thoughts about what you you might see or hope to see as we continue with this first season. Frida mentioned this before. I definitely want to see more about Aunt Viv and her past life, hopefully present life as an artist. Hopefully we can see more Will and Ashley interactions. I'm just curious as to where Hillary's character is going to go and if they're actually going to give her like a real relationship with Jazz. I'm already thinking that Uncle Phil will not like that. Hopefully we get Uncle Phil's real backstory. And I think those are the things I'm the most excited about. And then hopefully just any situation where I can have some empathy for Carlton. I think Uncle Phil and Aunt Vivian have something to do with Will's dad. What do you mean? There was something that was said about Aunt Vivian said we owe it to him when she was trying to make a case for Will staying. And when Aunt Vivian picked up the phone from Will's mom, Viola, Dr. Joy were talking about the tension. It once again seemed like Aunt Vivian knew that it was really, she owed it to her sister to do this. Mm. There's something about Will's dad that seems like it's connected to Aunt Vivian and Uncle Phil. So I, I really would like to flesh that out a bit more. I would love to see who Hillary's friends are. Mm. I think Hillary is just so fly. I want to see more of her. I want to see her friends. I want to see what they do. I want to see her like making content on the back. But, you know, maybe that's just, maybe I should just follow Coco Jones. (laughs) Right. What you really want to see is Coco Jones. (laughs) I just want to see Coco Jones. And then I want Carlton to be exposed as a drug user. So that way he can get the help that he needs. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Expeditiously. Right. How soon is that going to (laughs) happen? So I agree. I also am really interested in Aunt Viv's backstory. And I really want to see like, if they allow her art to flourish again this season. And, you know, like you mentioned, Frida, can we see a show, you know, like what's going on there and what is the, what is the story behind how she decided to kind of move out of her art career? I really want to know more about that. I mean, I'm also really interested in how they are going to follow these mental health angles. So is there going to be a school counselor that they introduce, you know, what is the conversation around like the flashbacks that Will is having? What is going to be the conversation around Carlton's drug use? You know, like how are they going to really tie these mental health angles together? That is what I am really, really interested to see. I have a question for you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Joy. 
they were to bring in a therapist or a licensed professional, which actress would you cast to be Ooh. either a school counselor or like a family therapist? Ooh, this is such a good question. I feel like Angela Bassett would be incredible. <laughs> I feel like she is like the perfect person to like be added to this cast. <laughs> Although most of these people are relatively newer. So let me think about like a newer person. I can't think of anybody. My mind settled on Angela and now I'm going blank. <laughs> I think you made the right choice. <laughs> I mean, can you go wrong with Angela? Really? No. <laughs> So any final thoughts about Bel Air and what we've seen or what we hope to see for this season? Well, we have six more episodes, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to have a total of 10 episodes. And I think it's just incredible that this began as a short film. And to see where it is at now, I'm incredibly impressed. I saw on Rotten Tomatoes that the critics rating is 65%. And I would like to heavily push back on that and give my official rating that Bel Air is a solid 90, solid 90, A minus, okay? (laughs) And if you haven't watched it because you think that you love the original so much, which is me, I would say give it a chance. Give it a chance. Yeah, I think most people will be shocked by how much they actually enjoy it once they get past the like, oh, I love the original. Because like we've been talking about, it is not really a reboot. It really is a reimagining of the story and they take it lots of different places. So I agree with people giving it a chance. Like Frida said, I'm happy to see like it come from the mind of like a smaller creator. And they're like, you know what, I'm gonna put in the work on this and People loved it and it blew up. I'm also really happy because something I worry about with reboots is it trying too hard to create some of the magic that the original did. I think Bel Air kind of establishes that like this is very different. We're our own thing, but we're going to pay a lot of nods and obviously, you know, use the characters, but pay a lot of nods to the original show but do our own thing and make it really fresh. I think fresh is like one of the best ways to describe it. I'll leave people with this. If you like are into high school dramas, like I am, I would categorize this a bit. This is better than a lot of the high school dramas out there today. I'll say that. It's on the better end. So it's a little less corny where I think some of the storylines are more in depth, more fleshed out. They're not touching and going on every like hot topic in the universe. So I'll give it like a solid 80. Ooh, these are some strong rankings. Yeah, so overall, we definitely encourage you to check it out if you haven't. You can stream it on Peacock. I believe the first episode is available for free, but the rest of them, and there may be some kind of trial period with Peacock. I'm not quite sure. If there's not, then we may need to see if we can get one for people because it definitely is something that that is worth your, maybe you want to wait until all the episodes are there, right, to, to binge them all. But it definitely is something I would encourage you to check out. And if the folks at Bel Air Peacock would like to give the Therapy for Black Girls production team an insight into season two, (laughs) please contact us as we're invested and we'd love to continue to support this incredible production. Love it. Love it. I'm so glad we were able to chat about one of our new favorite shows. If you haven't already, make sure to head on over to PeacockTV.com and sign up to catch up on all the episodes of Bel Air. If you're looking for a therapist in your area, be sure to check out our therapist directory at TherapyForBlackGirls.com slash directory. And if you want to continue digging into this topic or just be in community with other sisters, come on over and join us in the Sister Circle. It's our cozy corner of the internet designed just for Black women. You can join us at community.therapyforblackgirls.com. This episode was produced by Frida Lucas and Elise Ellis, and editing was done by Dennis and Bradford. Thank y'all so much for joining me again this week. I look forward to continuing this conversation with you all real soon. Take good care. This episode is brought to you by Hulu, celebrating Black history always. Hulu is committed to providing a platform for black stories to be seen with stories like Women of the Movement, Snowfall, Atlanta, Grownish, Power, 
Tyler Perry's Have and Have Nots, the award-winning documentary Summer of Soul, classics like Living Single, Hulu originals like Wu-Tang and American Saga, and much more. Hulu highlights stories that showcase black history, past and present, 365 days a year. Hulu subscription required. Terms apply. I'm Emmy Olea. On this podcast, I'm taking you on a search. A search for love. Emmy, 24, hardworking Latina. But there were other reasons I felt like I couldn't always be myself. My mom's in prison. This is Crumbs. My love story. It's a show about the things we settle for and the bits of ourselves that make us who we are. Listen to Crumbs on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. The Black Effect presents. I didn't know. Maybe you didn't either, but the history of Black people ain't rooted in slavery. Oh no, it's royalty, not despair. B. Dot here, and every day in February, I will give you a Black history fact that I didn't know. And maybe you didn't either. It's a rugged, ratchet, realistic look at history. Listen to I Didn't Know, Maybe You Didn't Either on the Black Effect Podcast Network, iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or just wherever you get your podcasts from. I didn't know.